everybody, it's Allie, and welcome to our YNR chat for Sunday, September 30th, 2012. I love YNR again! <laughs> Yay! I'm so happy right now. I enjoyed the show so much this week. It has just been a a breath of fresh air like it feels like a brand new day in Genoa City I can tell a difference that things are starting to turn out for the positive that like the dialogue seems snappier the actors seem way more engaged and I know technically these are still old scripts from the old uh, executives and whatnot but I did um, hear a rumor, or I mean a confirmed rumor, that they did punch them up a little bit, so I think some of the dialogue changed a little bit, and I can just tell a difference. I don't know if you guys feel that way, but I was floored with how good this week's show was. Like, it was, we had our 10,000th episode, which is a major, major milestone, and we got new opening credits, <laughs> which we're definitely going to talk all about later. It was, it was insane. We had deaths and weddings and resurrections. It was incredibly incredible. <laughs> so much has happened, and I, I, it's, I'm probably going to, I hope I don't leave anything out, but it's very possible that I might. Uh, I, I mean, the only place I can think to start is at the beginning. So let's just start at the beginning of the week and we'll work our way toward the end and we'll fill in all of the blanks in between. I can't wait. It's going to be good. So just backing up to where we were when the week started. The bad guys want Victor dead. They set him up to go to that warehouse meeting. There's an explosion, yada yada. <laughs> That's where we were when we last talked, you and I. So as people get exploded, all of these dock workers get exploded, of course they stumble into the only place there is, a bar! <laughs> so one by one these guys are coming in, they're all bloody and bruised and, and confused, disoriented, and no one knows where Victor is. With each person that walks through the door, you can see on Genevieve's face specifically that there's a hope that it's Victor, and it's not. No one knows where Victor is. And Genevieve is stuck in this really terrible position. She has said that she's a nurse, so now there is a, a, a horrible tragedy. People everywhere that need medical attention, she doesn't know what to do. She's just running around, scrambling, trying to help any way that she can. And deep down, I know that she feels so guilty because she could have prevented this. All she needed to do was reveal to Victor who he was. She could have got him out of town and none of this would have happened. So I, I could feel her guilt and her desperation. And I thought it was a very interesting choice to, to shoot that whole scene silently. We didn't know what anyone was saying. It was just the actions with music over it. And it did create kind of a haunting vibe about the whole thing still very very dark that whole that whole bar was just dark I, I was getting so tired of the darkness in that bar and that was almost like the end of it but luckily sister Celeste at the end of last week had I think figured out what was going on with Moran who knows maybe when some maybe someone confessed to her but she ran out uh, before the explosion and she must have rescued Victor or pre-warned him or dragged him out of the building or something, I don't know, but she got him to safety. And she, unfortunately though, she had to make people think that Victor really was dead. So she goes to Genevieve, reveals to Genevieve that, I'm sorry, Victor is dead. It's a crushing, horrible moment. Everyone, uh, the, the rest of the dock workers feel really bad about it, that he, he died. And finally, Sister Celeste takes Genevieve, Jenny, aside and reveals to her that Victor is not dead. She opens up the door to this little room in the mission and Victor's just sitting propped up on the bed and he's 
out of it, more out of it, more clouded than he's, than he's been in the past couple of weeks, which is pretty out of it and pretty clouded. But he's sitting there, he is just uh, disoriented. Genevieve starts to try to talk to him, and it was so heartbreaking because Victor looked at her and said, Where am I? Is, is this the orphanage? Oh. <laughs> he was recessed to this little boy, and that's kind of where he's been, or, or not even necessarily a little boy, but as a young man, he thought he was Christian Miller, and it was, it was bringing up all those feelings, and like that is what is at the core of Victor's character is that he was an orphan he was abandoned by his parents and that is the way the reason that he is why he is and it was hard to watch him go back to that especially since I've known Victor Newman since I was a kid Victor Newman has been in my life consistently since I was a child and it's hard to see him beaten up confused um, totally disoriented being deceived in a way by Genevieve and finally after having thought that he was dead Genevieve decides to help him out. She decides to uh, kind of prod him a little bit, point him in the right directions, and there's just this moment where Victor doesn't know who he is, and then he kind of spaces out for a second and comes back and realizes who he is. He starts to remember little by little, and Genevieve says, yes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you. I think her guilt becomes overwhelming, and she decides that she's going to help him fill in the blanks, and that's when he realizes his name isn't Christian, and this woman isn't Genevieve, Jenny, a nurse. He, she's, she's Genevieve, and he is Victor Newman. Back in Genoa City, Sharon is prepping for this press conference, the public display of support from the Newman family for her being the CEO of Newman Enterprises, and Tucker is right there every single moment along the way, playing her like a fiddle while he's diddling her. He's diddling her fiddle. <laughs> Tucker is such a sleazebag. Do you guys even think that he can be redeemed at this point? Is Tucker ever going to be redeemed? He used to be an alright character, and now he's just despicable. Do you guys think that he'll ever grow out of that? I don't know. I wonder if Sharon can be redeemed. She's in pretty much the same spot. She has become despicable, and I wonder if she'll ever go like shift back toward the middle. It was weird because Sharon had this moment before the press conference where she's feeling good about her accomplishment, what she's done. I think she's totally resolved in, in her actions at Newman Enterprises. But at the same time, she has this moment of feeling really, really alone, that even though the Newmans are sh publicly showing her support, she knows that they don't support her and that it's her against the world in, a, in the same way that it's kind of been her against the world for a while. And I thought she had a really interesting line where she starts to tell Tucker about how many people she's lost in her life, and specifically, she mentioned Drew and how Drew was her best friend and that she hasn't really had a friend like that since. And I am telling you guys, that is foreshadowing. Uh, I've already heard that the new writers have had their hands in these scripts that we're viewing now. I guarantee you that was plugged in there to start laying the groundwork for Drew returning, being buddy-buddy with Sharon. I'm telling you, I don't know if they're going to like, I don't think they're going to recast it. I think Victoria Rowell is coming back. I absolutely do think that that's in our future. There's no way that they're going to recast Drew. That It would be suicide for the show. They know that this is their last ditch effort to get YNR back on track. They're not just going to do a, a crummy recast of Drew. We're going to see the real thing coming back real soon. And I think that's going to be good for Sharon that maybe it, at, as she hits the pit of her despair, maybe Drew will be there to help her and be her friend again. And maybe that will usher in a new era of Sharon too. So I thought that was an interesting moment. Uh, I wanted to be sure to mention it. Now, back to the press conference. 
Everyone shows up in Victor's office for the press conference. Um, Nikki is fresh off of that phone call with Victor where he said her name. They, they, they got cut off, but he said her name and she's fueled by this hope for the first time that he is still alive and that he knows who she is and she just got a vibe off of that phone call. And by the way, Nikki looked so good at the press conference. Her hair is in such a good place right now. She just looked phenomenal and Nikki could not wait to tell Sharon about the phone call. Like, yeah, he's your husband, but guess what? I found him. I talked to him and Sharon in return couldn't wait to tell, to show Nikki that picture of Victor and Sister Celeste that Tucker had shown her. And it was just this one upping between the two women, which I love. I love Nikki versus Sharon. And it was so uncomfortable. And it led into the actual press conference, which starts with Victoria gnashing her teeth through these kind words about Sharon. She's trying to show a public display of support and it's killing her every moment. When in through Victor's office door walks Billy. Billy was in LA when the explosion happened and he was around to get the news that Victor had died, but he left before uh, Sister Celeste had revealed to J uh, Jenny <laughs> Genevieve that he was actually still alive. So Billy gets back to Genoa City in like five minutes. I mean, Victor's dead and then the next thing you know, Billy's back in Genoa City in Victor's office and he announces at the press conference that Victor Newman is dead. Billy, buddy, my friend, dude. Maybe that's something that you would have wanted to share in private with the family, not on live TV. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because it all just spiraled out. Everyone is shocked. Victor Newman is dead. Here it's this press conference saying that everything's going to be fine with his company. And no, not, not that at all. Victor is dead. And the cameras, I think, are like flashing. Everybody's gasping. And the only reaction that I even cared about was Nikki's. Oh, she was devastated. I just wanted to reach out and hug her and be like, Nikki, it's okay. He's still alive. <laughs> You'll be back together in a couple of days. <laughs> oh, it was heartbreaking. I mean, Nick and Victoria and Abby are all devastated, but it was Nikki's reaction that I was really, really focusing in on. And then there's Sharon. Sharon is off in the corner while everyone else is crying, scheming with Tucker. And Tucker's right there with his little Mr. Burns fingers like, oh, 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 oh Victor's dead. This is an opportunity for me. And he's pulling the strings again without missing a beat. He didn't even take a second to think about what his plan is. Everyone is, is shocked and grieving and he's there pushing and prodding her like, okay, Sharon, now it's time. You know, it's, he's talking to her like she's, he's the coach and he's saying, you got to get in there. You know, you got to take control of this situation. So Sharon reigns the press back in and tells them, you know, I'm sorry to hear this, but don't worry, you know, like I'm in control. It's cool. I got this. I'm Sharon Newman. I have just ta tanked the stock beyond probably repair, but it's all good. <laughs> I'm in control. <laughs> right, Sharon. Uh, her her delusion is it's it's like a train wreck. My God, you gotta watch it. It's it's so intense. Um, so the press leaves, and pretty much everyone turns on Sharon and Tucker. It's clear where the battle lines are, and everyone is disgusted with Sharon. But my favorite moment was the disgust. With, with Tucker and what he's doing and he shouldn't even be there. It's it, it's an abomination. It really is. And Abby had this great line where you almost like the rest of the family was just holding her back. She wanted to lunge herself over at Tucker and just rip his face 
face off. She was yelling at him like, I, well, I, when you're dead, I'm going to spit on your grave. Oh, that was a good, such a good line. Like, Abby had so many awesome lines this week. She was so good this week. And it, it's, uh, it's so disappointing. She, Abby's better than she's been in. I don't even know how long. And she's leaving. It just makes me wish that she wasn't going. I kind I hope they bring her back because when there's good writing, I really do think the character has potential. She really had some some comic relief in there, but I mean, and not even intentionally. There there was just a lot of um, oh, she's she brings a different perspective. She's a different age group, and I just thought, oh my gosh, you know, I just I liked I liked Abby this week, <laughs> but I was so annoyed by the fact that no one was really asking any questions. Everybody just took Billy's word for it, but no one was saying, well, how did he die? Because my reaction would be like, details. Give me some details. I want to know exactly what happened. But, you know, no one, he didn't even say that there was an explosion. It was just like, he's dead. Sorry. <laughs> and everybody bought it. Uh, I mean, I guess they just trusted his word. Um, but, and it was, it was, it was, it was difficult to watch because, like, everyone had their own reactions, but there were so many mixed reactions, and it was interesting to see how every single member of, or, or citizen of Genoa City reacted to Victor's death. I mean, there was surprise, and grief, and anger, and uh, just confusion. Uh, it was so good. I mean, gosh. I remember the first time the very first time that Genoa City thought that Victor Newman was dead. Ugh, oh, the memories. And there was a brief moment in there where Sharon actually thought Victor was dead. We all know that she eventually learned the truth uh, before everyone else, but there was a moment where Sharon thought Victor was dead. And her coldness really, really bothered me. It, 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 I just feel like Sharon and Victor had a really rocky last couple of months, but Sharon and Victor were close and had a very special relationship for a decade. And it bothered me that she was so robotic about it, that she just snapped right into, all right, take control, uh, f good for me mode, I mean, I I always, I guess, wanted to believe that deep down underneath this facade, this rocky, cold facade that Sharon was putting out there, that she was still a human being. <laughs> and I didn't get that vibe from her at all. Like, she went to go identify his body alone. She didn't want Tucker there. She didn't want anybody else there. None of the rest of the family. She's the wife. She goes to ID the body. And she was, I think mortified by what she was having to do, but at the same time, I think that she was mostly concerned about what this meant for her future, what it meant that she was going to gain. Victor's loss was going to be her gain. She takes a look at his charred body. The more, more, more guy lifts up the sheet, she looks at him and she's shocked and asks for a moment alone. So the morgue guy leaves her alone and she calls out, damn you, Victor. And there was a moment where you don't know what to think. You don't know if she's cursing him even as she thinks he's dead. But uh, a, a commercial break later, she reveals, oh, it's not you. What are you, you want to, you faking your own death now? Like she's concocted this incredibly elaborate story in her mind about how Victor's doing this just to mess with her. And she realizes that he's not dead. She's not going to share this information. She's just going to go along with it. She thinks that she's going to one-up him. She thinks that she is going to uh, play along with this game that he's playing, and she decides to not tell anyone that it's not his body. She, she doesn't tell his family. She doesn't tell Tucker, for one. She, uh, you would think that she would tell Tucker, her little plotting partner, but off, meanwhile, Tucker's doing his own plotting. He's trying to figure out how this is all going to work out to his benefit. One thing that was weird, I'm, I thought, well, why didn't Tucker even call Genevieve? Like, he heard that Victor was dead. 
Genevieve was there on Tucker's behalf. She was there providing updates f about Victor every step along the way, and now all of a sudden there was an explosion. He's dead. He doesn't think to call her, at the very least, to make sure she's all right. I thought that was very strange. Um, whatever. He's only concerned about himself. He, like, this, he, Victor's dead, and in his mind, he's like, ah, with Victor out of the way, I can manipulate Sharon into taking total control of Newman Enterprises. Good for me. And you know what will really seal this deal? If I marry her. What? <laughs> oh my gosh. I, uh, Tucker proposed to Sharon. It was the most literal proposal that I've ever seen. It was literally, I propose that you marry me. This will be a good relationship, beneficial for both of us. I was, I, I, I was like, what? I'm what? I was watching that uh, episode at, like midnight in the dark, just quietly in bed. And I'm like, what? You know, like screaming out, they're going to get married. Sharon, they're going to get married. Sharon's going to bury Victor and then marry Tucker. This is insanity. <laughs> Sharon goes right along with it. They don't discuss it. They don't talk about what the benefits would be. They were just like, she, Tucker proposes and she's like, yes, yes, I believe this is a good idea. And she goes right along, right along with it. Ugh. Mm -mm -mm. And by the time the rest of the family even arrived at the morgue, not even knowing what all has gone on, just clueless in their grief, they show up at the morgue and the morgue guy tells them, sorry, Sharon and Victor are gone and <laughs> they want to see the body. The family naturally wants to see the body, although I don't even know if that is natural because I don't know if I would want to see his, his my family members charred remains, but you know, maybe that was going to give them closure. But the doctor guy tells them, um, oh yeah, Sharon had the body cremated before everyone else could see and he's gone. How rude. She quickie, Sharon quickie had him cremated and left. Like, I was totally on with, like, I've been with Nikki on this entire journey, this entire week. Nikki just, as soon as she heard that, she just said, oh my god, I'm going to kill her. Best funeral ever. <laughs> oh, it was, Victor's funeral was so freaking good. It was actually less of a funeral and more of a Sharon social hour. <laughs> ah! She had taken complete control over the service with like a quickie ceremony and a ba quickie burial. <laughs> like she basically was ready to just dump him on the ground. She texts everyone. To, I can't even believe she gave them that. She texts everyone to come to the church. Like, Victor Funeral at noon. Hope you can be there. It was so, she might as well have sent out party invitations. <laughs> the family was furious. Ugh. The first shot of the ceremony that we saw was Nick running into the church, screaming Sharon's name. Sharon! Oh, he was so ticked off. And he looked up and saw at the podium Victor in a jar. It was a weird moment when Nick realized that's my father's remains. This great man, larger than life, is in a jar. It was, it was, it took me a moment. To, it definitely took me back that it was just the first realization. Victor's real funeral is gonna be, oh, so I hope they never do that. <laughs> I never want to see Victor's actual funeral. I was able to laugh it off because I knew it wasn't real, but Victor's actual funeral would tear me up. Ugh. So anyway, everybody arrives at the church and uh, except for Sharon. Actually, Sharon is the last to arrive. Sharon and her boy toy. But all of the rest of the real family was there. Nikki, again, looking so beautiful. Nikki is the real widow here, you guys. She... I felt it. She had this, she just embodied it. She was grieving. You could see it on her face and her body, but she looked so good the whole time. 
Victoria was totally stone-faced cold. Nick was angry. He had so much rage in him right now. And Sharon stumbles in at the last moment, last to arrive, acting like it's a party. I, I couldn't believe how casual and whatever she was acting. She throws off her coat to reveal that she is wearing a white party slash wedding dress. Oh my god! Oh my god! <laughs> that was such a classic moment. I could not believe it. I had to rewind and watch that again. Everybody else, black morning Sharon, pure white wedding party dress. Hell yeah. Oh, it was so freaking uh, good. Like everyone in the crowd gasped, could not believe their eyes at the total and complete lack of class. The complete and total lack of respect. Everyone is just looking at her like, have you lost your freaking mind? And Sharon just plays it off, just says, oh, I'm sorry, I have, I have an engagement after this. You know, I'm very, very busy. Actually, as a matter of fact, I'm getting married after this. Like, the crowd, like, the, the collective crowd dropped their jaws that she's burying and getting married on the same day. Like, it, in fact, everyone except Sharon was uncomfortable because if you look at Tucker's face during that scene, even he was uncomfortable. Even he was like, wow, this is in bad taste. <laughs> I can't believe Sharon. Like, I, she was just so, so incredible. Everybody sits down amazingly. It doesn't strangle her to death. They don't rip her hair out, pull her to pieces, and then bury her in the ground. Actually, everybody sits down for the ceremony. Sharon gets up to give a speech about Victor. And I thought that the Sharon dress moment couldn't be topped. But I have to say, the moment with Nick and Victoria and Abby in the pew while Sharon is giving her speech was so good. Abby is just saying, Sharon is a slut. I cannot believe what a slut Sharon is. She is a complete and total slut. Oh my God, I can't believe I'm saying slut in church. It was so comic relief. I love it. It was like Abby had the most real reaction out of all of this. It was such a classic, beautiful little moment. Like, she said something like it kept going on and Abby is like shocked at the words that are coming out of her mouth and she just said God thinks Sharon's a whore too and <laughs> Victoria's just like amen <laughs> that's good writing that is good writing that moment alone was just like oh thank you Lord Nick tries to take back control of this whole th whole thing and just and he stands up to try to say some words at his father's funeral but Sharon grabs the ashes and marches out to bury them before anyone else could speak which it's so not even fitting for Victor Newman wouldn't you expect Victor Newman's body to be in a mausoleum I would expect them to like freeze his head or <laughs> Something. Of course, if the Newman family had anything to say about it, they probably would have had him stuffed and bound and like, uh, or no, they would have just had him stuffed and they would have like propped him up at the ranch so that he could be standing there for eternity with his arms crossed and, you know, maybe like a very stern look on his face at the ranch, <laughs> preserve him forever. But no, Sharon's just going to go dump him in the ground. And even Jack... Victor's greatest all-time enemy looked at the family and said, my God, even I'm offended by that. If Jack had to plan the funeral, he would have done a better job. Sharon was incorrigible, but brilliant. Sharon Case was brilliant. I, I, I've never even seen her act this way. It was like she's been nuts up until now. This was nuts times ten. Nuts, nuts to the tenth 
before. Like, I, like I, I think everybody had a little bit of extra oomph in them this week, but Sharon, especially, at the gravesite, Nikki was trying to scold Sharon, tell her what a horrible person she was. Sharon was checking her watch and just zoned out. She wasn't even listening to what Nikki was saying. She, like, sh this whole time, Sharon has just been, like, this impetuous child. Finally, she's just like, oh, I gotta go. She floats away like this is no big deal. She has, I, I, I mean, she knows it's getting under their skin. I think that's the reason she's doing it, is she knows Victor's alive. She knows that it's getting under the rest of the Newman skin, and that's what she's into right now. But finally, she just leaves, leaves the rest of the family there to mourn, which it got, it's such a horrible thing to do. If you know that he's not dead and you let them mourn, oh, Sharon, it is a new low. As funny as it was, my God, that is a new low because what followed was the, kind of the real service. Like after Sharon left, the rest of the family said, let's let's give him the what he deserves. Let's let's have our moment where we actually really talk about him and respect him and honor him and pay tribute to him. And it was Abby and Nick and Victoria and Nikki and they all said what they needed to say about, you know, about the man who has shaped their lives and let me tell you guys, like the f the whole front of my shirt as I'm watching these scenes was soaked in tears. I'm not even I, I'm not even exaggerating. Like I'm sobbing as everybody's recalling Victor and uh, how they feel about him. the whole front of my shirt got soaked with my own tears. I reached up, touched it, and I'm like, oh my god, <laughs> why it are is back. They've got my emotions all wrapped in on this. Like everybody talking about Victor really got me like even at the athletic club Catherine was sort of taking the chief role um, with Victor's colleagues it was the the colleagues remembering him it was like um, Michael and Neil and I actually really appreciated hearing Michael and Neil speak about Victor I think Paul should have probably been in there speaking about him I don't think he did but hearing everybody talk about this man and Catherine gave this just incredible speech it was voiced over um, with with Nikki at the gravesite Catherine's talking about how Victor Newman always has you know the last laugh and Nikki is on her knees at Victor's grave having sent everyone else away she's like I just want to be alone I need this for myself and she's crying and talking to Victor's spirit and or talking to herself and she's just saying you were supposed to come back to me it wasn't supposed to be like this you were supposed to come back to me one more time and just as she says that we see two feet entering the scene two dressed in very nice leather shoes and a suit <laughs> <laughs> and it pans up, it's Victor's face, and he's looking very kind, you know, he has various faces, but this face is kind, and he looks down at Nikki, Nikki looks up as if she's seen a ghost, and I think she can't believe her eyes at first, she stands up, and he's like opening with open arms they're like ready for their embrace and she comes to him and I think it's not until the moment that she touches him that they actually embrace that she realizes that it's true that it's real that he's not dead and they're just standing there embracing I am crying and sobbing and it's such a beautiful moment and I lost my mind Hmm, let me check my calendar for today. Let's see. Bury one husband, check. Marry a shiny new one. <laughs> you guys, Sharon is incredible. She took her wedding bouquet from the funeral flowers. My God, you guys. What an amazing touch. 
that was. She walks in, sees this, the, the bouquet from her husband's funeral, plucks out a few, and then goes to marry another guy. Like The moment where she took the, that bouquet, that moment alone tells me that things on YNR are getting better. That is a beautiful, beautiful touch. She walks down the aisle, and Tucker shows up. Of course, she thought, oh, is he even going to be here? It's such a bad idea. And after that crazy, crazy funeral, I'm so, I mean, getting married, the, getting married in the same church you just, too, that you just buried your husband. My God. Ugh. But Tucker does show up, and the little sneaky rat that he is, he decides that he is going to ask her to sign a prenup. Of course. I mean, look what she did to Victor. Like, if you're going to play with fire, you at least got to try to cover your bases. She burned her prenup to Victor, so of course he's going to get her to, to sign a prenup. But my question is, did Sharon even read what was in that prenup? What was in that prenup is the question. What did she sign? Because she didn't read it. She grabs the document, turns around, signs it on his back without really even looking for it. It's funny, looking at it, it's funny to me that Sharon thinks she is uh, smart enough to go toe to toe with Victor. I mean, rule number one of anything, don't sign something that you haven't looked at. I mean, we all know that. I don't sign anything unless I've read it fully. So, like, what are you even thinking, <laughs> Sharon? Like, it's just, it was, uh, she's such a ditz. <laughs> but she's trying to walk in these big girl shoes. Oh, my goodness. Well, they proceed with their marriage ceremony. Nick walks in, takes a seat in the pews. Genevieve walks in, takes a seat in the pews. And the, they say their vows, which, the, like, the fact that they said them in front, in, in front of a priest was like, are you kidding me? Like, the whole, the vows were a joke, and then saying those vows in front of a priest was like a double what the hell, or what, what are you thinking? But the entire time the ceremony's going on, it's a very wait for it kind of moment where you know Victor has returned. When's he gonna, he's right outside with Nikki. When's he gonna show up? Is he gonna interrupt the ceremony? And there's, of course, the moment where uh, the priest says, does anyone know a reason why these two should not be married? Everybody kind of looks back at Nick and Genevieve. Are they gonna say anything? But of course the audience is going, well, is Victor gonna be, well, well are we gonna hear? I have a objection, you know? <laughs> but no, it was, it was like building, building, building. They get all the way to the end of the ceremony where the priest pronounces them husband and wife and that's the moment where Victor walks in, reveals himself, the fact that they're, technically he and Sharon are still married. Nikki is standing right by Victor's side, just smiling smugly. <laughs> like, I told you so, Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> and both of them just look like they're ready to smack Sharon down to the ground. And that's exactly what I want to happen, too. Um, the rest of the family shows up uh, because Nikki has texted them and told them to come back to the church, like Catherine and Victoria, Nick, Abby. And, like, that, there was a little bit of disappointment. Like, it was good, but there was just a little bit of disappointment in that I felt like the kids weren't shocked enough. Everybody wasn't shocked enough. Uh, Abby seemed to be the only one who was, like, really, really shocked and surprised. Like, she immediately ran up and hugged Victor. Like, if I thought that a family member was dead, just grieved for them, and in the middle of that intense grief, they're standing there in front of me, I would faint. I think I would pass out. Everybody else was just like, yay, dad's back. Good. Oh, good. Now let's get Sharon. <laughs> um, which is pretty much what happened. Victor, he remembers everything. Everything. Like, it didn't take very long. I think Genevieve filled in some of the blanks, and then he remembered the rest of it. And he tells all, to Sharon and to us, the viewers, that that night they went riding on their horses. Victor fell off of his horse, landed on his head. 
<laughs> and staggered, rather than staggering back to the ranch, he staggered out into the, the street, the highway, and a trucker came by, picked him up, took him out to Los Angeles, and that's where he was working as a dock worker. Um, he also pretty much uh, t tell, he told about what Genevieve's role in it was, um, and of course Genevieve got some grief from that. Everybody's like, well, you did the right thing, but it was too little too late. Eventually you told the truth, but it was when it suited your own purposes, which is true. Um, although, but, you know, we know Genevieve did try. She, she absolutely should have revealed the truth. His fa she knew his family was worried about him, and she did nothing. You can't ignore that. But at the same time, I think she did try to look after him. She was kind with him. Um, and Victor revealed that he knew from Genevieve all about what Tucker had done. Um, and <laughs> Tuck, like everyone, of course, is ready to like lynch Tucker, including Catherine, later on. She approached him about his role in all of this. She practically spit on him. It was a great scene. Um, and as Victor's revealing all, the only thing he's really not talking about is Billy. He's not really saying that Billy knew. I mean, Tucker and Genevieve and Billy knew about uh, where he was. And he just, he... he said nothing. Like, he knew the entire time and said nothing to everyone. Instead, he just kept the focus right on Sharon. He told Sharon, you know what? I'm done with you. I want you to go back and get out of my house. <laughs> Which I, I'm sure what he really meant to say was, get the hell out of my house! Pretty much everyone in Genoa City found out that Victor was dead and alive on the same day, <laughs> it seemed. But I'm I'm glad that everyone found out right away. I I'm just I'm pleased that it wasn't drug out. I didn't want to see everybody's individual reactions. Just like it was, it moved quick. It was fast paced. It I felt like it tied up a lot of loose ends. Just bam, right in one or two episodes. And I just really appreciated that Victor is you know back. Everybody knows about it. We're moving on. Let's just move on past where we've been. You know, they, he called a press conference and did the whole. Rumors of my death have been greatly exaggerated thing. <laughs> and uh, more importantly, Nikki and Victor went home and made love all night. <laughs> I'm so, I was so glad to see that. I'm glad Nikki's back in Victor's arms because I feel hopeful that we're going to start seeing a different side of Victor because we have different writers. It's, it's I, It should be different. Um... And I feel that it was it was great to see Nikki and Victor having their moment after the sex where they talked about their relationship. You know, they um, Nikki said she was sorry for or she shouldn't have married Jack. And Victor said, I made mistakes, too. You know, we've both done things to hurt each other. And they acknowledged that they were sorry for the past, but that they're ready for the future. And that's how I feel exactly about the show right now. I feel real sorry for the past year at least, or at least, no, 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 I'm just saying, I feel real sorry for at least the past couple of months. And I, I'm, I just tell you, I am ready for the future. Now that Sharon's been kicked out of the main house, where's she gonna go? Maybe she's gonna go with her new boyfriend, Tucker. Uh, no, sorry, that's not gonna happen. It, they, both Sharon and Tucker realized they were lying to each other. Sharon didn't reveal the truth to Tucker about knowing Victor wasn't, that the body wasn't really Victor's, and Tucker didn't reveal to Sharon that he knew where Victor was the whole time, and he was keeping him away. So, Sharon goes to Tucker, thinking, with her bags packed, thinking she's going to go move in with him. And Tucker slams the door in her face, literally. That relationship was over before it even began, but it is definitely over now. So, Sharon, with no other place to go, goes back to her house on the ranch. I'm surprised she even tried to move in with Tucker after what she knows he did to her. She's obviously so desperate, doesn't want to be alone. And I can't imagine why she would even want to be on the ranch. But Sharon owns that house. Sharon owns Nick and Sharon, uh, their old house. She got it in the divorce. But Victor owns the land. Sharon owns the house, but Victor owns the land. Victor, like, I can't, I'm surprised Victor doesn't have the house 
relocated. I'm surprised he hasn't picked the house up off the ground and move it somewhere else. <laughs> because if he owns the land, he, shouldn't he be able to just kick her right off? I would think so. Well, Sharon had just unpacked her bags back at the old house. Ugh, she needs to reconnect with who she was, I think, a little bit. And, and come back toward the middle. I don't want her to be a doormat, but this crazy Sharon needs, needs to come back a couple of notches. So I'm hoping she starts to reconnect with who she was there and come out a new woman. Maybe she could change her name from Newman to New Woman. <laughs> but her mom shows up practically as soon as she had her bags unpacked, and her mom asked her to move back with her. She's like, just come home, girl. <laughs> That's what she always call her. Come home, girl. You don't belong here. And Sharon's not having it. She believes she does belong there. She is a Newman for crying out loud. She's been married to all of them. She is, you know, by proxy, she is a Newman. Uh, but for once, I actually agreed with Doris. I never agree with Doris. She's always like a wet blanket on everything. But this time, Doris said, you need to get away from this. You know, you need to come live with me, come get, you know, in touch with who you really are. She tried to extend this olive branch to her daughter and Sharon wasn't having it. So Doris left her a key, said my door is open, and if you decide to take it, then, you know, please feel free. But Sharon is so, so not going to go out like that. She's not going to go out easy. Even Nikki comes down to the main house after her resolution with Victor, her reunion with Victor. She comes down to Sharon's house and busts right in the door. I love, like, I'm loving Nikki versus Sharon because the moment Sharon opened the door, Nikki just walked right in, didn't wait, didn't even look Sharon in the eye. Just as soon as that door was open, Nikki was pushing her way through. <laughs> she whips out her checkbook and says, all right, Sharon, how much money do you want to just go away? One million? Two million? Which I love that Nikki can just write a $2 million check out of her checking account. <laughs> God, why can't that be my life? Uh, but, you know, it's not about this for Sharon. One or $2 million really isn't probably going to make a dent in the type of lifestyle that she's been living. And she even said so much. I've gotten used to the type of lifestyle that being married to Victor afforded me. So I'm not just going to go away with one or $2 million. Uh, so Nikki's little plan didn't work. And she goes back up to the main house uh, just as Victor is getting home and checking the mail and in the mail he has a little a little court uh, notification that Sharon is suing him for abandonment really like why like can't you think of a better way to get back at Victor suing him for abandonment? What can you possibly even get out of that? It's, it's, it's obviously not about the money. It's about putting Victor through the ringer. But at this point, I think, why poke the bear? If, I mean, getting Victor all riled up is going to be a bad idea. You should, you should at least cut your losses, take a day to think about what would be the best approach. But I knew that when she left the ranch, she was a little too happy. She was a little too like, okay, I'm just going to leave. It's fine. I knew she had something up her sleeve. I just think <sighs> suing him for abandonment is kind of ridiculous because Victor's just going to counteract. In fact, we saw from the previews of next week's show, Victor is going to have Sharon arrested. For what? I don't know. But... <laughs> Sharon could very well go to jail, and Victor is not going to be there to rescue her this time. And then there's Billy. Victor has been telling the truth about everything that happened, but not mentioned a word about Billy. And the whole time that all of this is going on, Billy is sweating. He just has a feeling that everything is going to blow up in his face with his marriage because he didn't tell his wife that he knew about her father and where he was. It was very like, it was, it was kind of very like an I Love Lucy moment because Billy's all worried and I'm just looking at him like, Billy, you got some splaining to do. <laughs> uh, well, Victor starts giving Victoria a call and tells her that he wants to see her. He has something to tell her. And Victoria's like, it doesn't matter what it is. I'm in such a good mood. Just let's, let's get it all out. Let's get the truth out. So Victor comes to Billy and Victoria's house. And the whole time, Billy is practically biting his nails, just waiting for Victor to drop the other shoe. And 
And what happened was really not what he was expecting. I had a feeling, but it was not what Billy was expecting. Victor realized that Victoria did such a good job at stepping it up at Newman while he was away that he wants to offer for her to come back to Newman. And he even said, like, write your own contract. Whatever your terms are, it's fine. Just, I want you to come back and be part of the family business, which I'm sure she's going to say yes to. And I was really glad to see that. And Victoria is, I, th I think Victoria is getting exactly what she wanted all along. I think she was thinking that Victor was going to come back and praise her for doing such a great job and that he would bestow upon her another, you know, position at Newman, a high-ranking power at, the, at this company that is her legacy. So I'm sure she's going to say yes. Of course, she, you know, skips off upstairs to do her thing and Billy and Victor have this moment alone together uh, where Billy says, all right, what's up? You know, you didn't tell her now. Or are you just going to hold it over my head and try to tell her another time? And Victor just says, you know, when we were in L.A., I saw a different side of you. I know that you went in and tried to rescue me from the explosion. I thought you were, you know, if, if I would have known who you were at the time, it would have been a different story. But I saw something different in you. And, you know, it's I'm not going to tell her. I'm not going to tell her. And I thought it was like the f the first selfless thing that Victor has done in a long time, just allowing the slate to be clean between he and the son-in-law who he's had a rivalry with for so long. And Victor just said, I want Victoria to be happy, and if you're the one that makes her happy, then that's fine with me, you know? <laughs> I just wonder, how long is that going to last? There were a couple of other reactions to Victor's death and resurrection that I wanted to really hone in on. And the first one was Adam. He was isolated during a lot of this. He was not part of the family. And it was weird because he was just saying about, like how he didn't care about his father at all when the news came in that Victor was dead. And it was strange to see him act so cold the whole time, but I think that that's what Adam does. I think that when he gets hurt, then he freezes up and he doesn't want to show that he has an, any emotion because an emotion is viewed as weakness. And he was talking to Chelsea throughout this and saying that he did feel sad, not for himself, but that his child that's on the way will never know either of his parents. They'll never know that side of him. And it got him thinking, um, you know, about his mom. I mean, he lost his mom and he lost his dad, and, and that had to affect him. There was this really annoying moment, though, where he almost tried to make a comparison between Chelsea and Hope. And let me tell you, Chelsea is no hope, okay? A new hope, and Chelsea's no hope. <laughs> Hope never gave away her child. Hope never tried to steal Victor or manipulate anything. Hope was like a pure white angel. Hope never did a thing wrong. She's one of the few characters on the show that never did a thing wrong, which is why she's dead and not on the show anymore. But let's just try, let's not make crazy comparisons here. Okay, Adam, I hope, I hope they get rid of her. I really do. I'm sorry. I, I, I mean, like, there's been a lot of Michael Mooney <clears throat> talking throughout all of this, uh, about his character and where it's headed and I know he's getting a lot of angry messages from fans who are just not happy with the state of the show right now and he I did you know I was reading his Twitter feed and he was saying that he's really happy with the new scripts where Adam is heading he was saying that uh, he doesn't think that Adam is going to be written vanilla anymore or being cartoonishly evil. He thinks that Adam is heading in a very smart, intelligent direction and that he's really happy. So I'm hoping that I'm going to be happy. <laughs> I mean, I think we're already starting to see little glimmers of Adam coming out of his shell, still being cold but coming out of his shell because Adam was hurt by the fact that he wasn't included on the Newman family gatherings. I mean, he, he left the funeral early. He, he, did, he went to the service, didn't go to the graveside. He just felt outcast. And when Victor, when it turned out that Victor was alive, nobody called him. 
Nobody even told him. He found out that Victor, that his father was still alive from the press conference that Victor held. And I know that that had to hurt him. Now, Adam has made his own bed. Adam could easily, when he came back into Genoa City for the first time or at any many junctures along the road, Adam could have bonded with the family. He could have tried to be part of the family, and he never did. So I'm sorry on the one hand, Adam, like you were never close with them. You never tried to be close with them. So don't whine that you're not when they don't include you. I mean, yes, it was very thoughtless. Nikki should have been the one to call Adam. She is kind of the matriarch of the family. She should have reached out to the ones that are in Victor's closest circle instead of just letting him find out about it on the news. But at the same time, he's Adam. I mean, he he never tried to make himself a part of the family, but he did go out to the ranch uh, to to try to talk to Victor, I guess. He went out there, Nikki answered the door, reluctantly let him in, but had to let him know that Victor wasn't there. He had gone to see Victoria, and it left Adam feeling very abandoned in that same way that Victor felt abandoned by his parents. And Adam just said, oh, yeah, I could see he's off with... Nick and Victoria, no time for me. It was it was a very, very sad moment for Adam, and I'm curious, to, I am curious by this. I want to see what Adam is going to do next week and how the dynamic between father and son is going to change or stay the same or accelerate because it's just the question begs. Adam went out to the ranch to see Victor. If Victor would have been there, what would Adam have said to him? Another one of Victor's enemies who had a mixed reaction to his death that's really worthy of exploring is Jack. Jack had both an emotional and a business investment in Victor and what was going to happen to Victor. And when Jack found out that Victor died, I think he realized that he, and he even said that he lost more than he expected. I think that Jack was affected more than he expected. I would have liked to have even seen more of that. I really, you know, I didn't want things to be stretched out, but I would have almost liked to focus in just a touch more on Jack, although it was good. It was good to see Jack feeling like he lost a piece of himself. I mean, the business stuff aside, Jack has been motivated for years by his rivalry, rivalry with Victor. What happens when all that is gone? If Victor is removed from Jack's life, who is he? You know, what does he have? What is his driving force? What's his motivating factor? And then, so wonderfully, Tracy came back. I was so happy to see Tracy back. I wish Tracy was back all the time. She's so good. She always comes in and just she's full of wisdom and heart and she's just such um, an amazing character and I feel like YNR needs that heart. I, I wish they would bring her back a little more often. And I, I mean speaking of hearts, thinking that Victor died, Tracy felt that that was the last piece of Colleen having died. Um, Colleen, her daughter, uh, had died and Victor received Colleen's heart as a transplant and it was Tracy that really allowed that to happen. Jack didn't want it to happen at all but Tracy was the one that gave Colleen's heart to Victor and she felt that that was like losing Colleen over and over again or that or that, that was you know the final piece of her that had died um, and that made Jack take pause and really think about that as well. Although not for too long because Jack had leveraged himself to, too much. He'd leveraged against Beauty of Nature completely, leveraged against Jabot to an extent to get money to buy up all of this Newman stock while Victor was gone thinking that it was going to skyrocket again and make him a very, very rich man. Uh, but the fact that um, the bank called in his note, or I can't remember what they said, what they called it, but basically... Jack had to sell Beauty of Nature in order to get the money to, I don't know, whatever, call in or, I don't know, something. He had to sell Beauty of Nature to Tucker, which is, uh, it, it was so hard that it, it, he had to sell it and to Tucker and to Boot just hours to early. If Jack would have held on to Beauty of Nature another day, his whole plan would have worked out. Victor would have come back, the stocks would have risen, and he would have owned Beauty of Nature, Jabot, a ton of Newman stocks. Things would have worked out so well for him. But now, Tucker, 
holds pretty much all of the cards. Tucker's sitting in a really good position. He's got Beauty of Nature, a significant chunk of Newman stock, and he's a board member. So Jack is feeling completely screwed. It was like a weird moment when Jack realized how screwed he was, and he said something like, Victor won again. You know, he, he didn't even, Victor, you didn't even know you were out to get me, and you still got me. Which, I hope that we explore this a little bit more in the future, because it's like, that is, that right there is Jack's problem. He did this to himself. It didn't have anything to do with Victor. Victor didn't intend to hurt you this time. You did it to yourself through your constant reaching out to get Victor or reaching out to get more. And even Tracy called him out on that and said, you had everything. Why did you have to go out and try to get more? It's the very essence of Jack's character, and I, which I, I like about that. I like that that's kind of his tragic story. It's just too bad that he can't see that. He can't see that it's his eternal reaching uh, for more than what he has and his inability to be satisfied that constantly gets him into these th this mess. <sighs> but... Jack uh, thinks he can get the sale nullified. He thinks he's going to get Beauty of Nature back. Tracy looked at him like, no, Jack, no, it's sold. Stop, stop while you're ahead or, you know, while you haven't lost everything. But no, he thinks he's going to get Beauty of Nature nullified. And he has an ally from a very interesting place, Genevieve. Genevieve has been burned by Tucker. Um, I don't even know why Genevieve went back to Tucker after she got back into town and after she helped Victor come back into town and reveal the, reveal the entire truth, she goes back to Tucker and it wonders why he stopped depositing money into her account. Really? You totally backstabbed Tucker and you think he's still going to pay you? Well, as soon as Tucker, I mean, I guess she gave him a chance, but as soon as Tucker was like, uh, no, honey, goodbye, Genevieve runs right to Jack and says that she is going to offer to help bring Tucker down. She knows that he has been illegally purchasing all of these shares of Newman. He's been setting up offshore companies and she can prove it. So she's going to hopefully help Jack get it back. Like I for one hope that Genevieve does help Jack get it back because I'd like to see someone knock the that smug smile right off of his sunglass wearing indoors face. Both Danny and Chris were back in Genoa City for the 10,000th YNR episode, and it's kind of funny because they both really just wanted to take a swing at Phyllis. Like, if either one of them could get away with just knocking her out, they would probably do it. <laughs> I've been surprised to see more of Christine lately. It's just, she's practically reoccur recurring now. I mean, she's on the show quite a bit, which is good because I feel like Christine makes a really good rival for Phyllis. It's classic, it has history, and I think that they're kind of funny going back and forth between each other. They're completely opposite women, and it's fun to watch them jab at each other because everyone was at the athletic club gathered this week for the post-Victor party, post-Victor funeral party, and <laughs> Phyllis was jabbing at Chris, saying something like, wow, you've been with every man in this room. How does that feel? <laughs> And Lauren chimed in and said, well, I've been with them all, too, and I don't feel awkward. <laughs> Michael just looked at Lauren and said, well, thanks, honey. <laughs> that was a funny moment. Lauren is funny. I'd like to see more of Lauren on the show. Bring her back more full time because she's losing it. She's starting to get real nervous about Sheila being in town again because somebody broke Daisy out of the mental institution. Who was it is the question. Um, of course, Lauren initially thought that it was Phyllis. So they got the surveillance tapes of the woman who broke out uh, Daisy and Lauren thinks it's Sheila. She's now convinced more than ever that Sheila is not dead and that she's, you know, the one that actually broke Daisy out because the woman said that it was, that she was Daisy's mother. But it's gotta be, gotta be Patty. I, 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 Patty's right there. You can't ignore the Patty factor. She's in a room right next door. And Paul went to talk to her this week and just to see if she knew anything. And Patty played crazy like she always does. But she's not crazy. She's lucid. She knows something and she doesn't want to reveal it. So I'm kind of wondering if maybe... 
just maybe Patty impersonated Emily and got Daisy out of the ward? Oh my gosh, for as much drama as going on on screen right now, I think there's equally as much drama going on behind the scenes. There's a little bit, a couple of casting updates. First of all, Summer is going to be recast. Um, it's somebody who apparently the head or the executive producer has worked with before, and apparently somebody who's worked with the recast of Noah. So we should be seeing the new Summer and probably the new Noah coming along, I'm going to say within the next two or three weeks, possibly. So that's something to look out for. I hope it's good. I'd like to see Phyllis's daughter be different, just not a spoiled brat. I hope that they just take the personality in a completely different direction. Um, let's see other you know probably good news for everyone uh well some people me anyway <laughs> crystal khalil is staying they were able to renegotiate her contract so lily is going to stay on the scene which gives me hope that we're gonna be able to bolster neil and i still think drew's coming back so maybe that will uh cause some tension there or some happiness there i don't know kind of depends we'll see where they take it and also uh billy miller was rumored to be not re-signing his contract but it sounds like he may be reconsidering that so i i think maybe we'll be seeing less of billy within the next few weeks but he may ultimately come back it sounds like that's less of a done deal uh, I was uh, reading this really good interview with the new head writer, and it's a TV, you, you can look it up, it's like, the guy's name is Josh Griffith, Griffin, Josh Griffin maybe, and it's a TV Guide interview, so if you just look up like Google Young and the Restless head writer TV Guide interview, I'm sure you'll find it, but it was really, really revealing. It said a lot about where the new writers are planning to take the show and to me it sounds like they're planning to take it back in a really core to a really core place they're cutting some of the the characters that are integral and they're focusing in on the main ones the newmans the abbots he specifically mentioned which is i think why they want to bring billy back he's the only other one if they're getting rid of abby um it seems like they're going to try to really build up paul and I think that they are going to focus on the winters. So it, it definitely gave me hope. You guys have got to see that article. It's really, really, search it out because it's really um, telling. I think that, I think we're headed in a good direction. I feel really, really positive about where we're going. And I'm already starting to see some changes. Let's hope that they keep up. I think it'll be, um, I think it'll be very interesting. There's like just so much going on behind the scenes right now too because have you guys heard about this little Twitter war with Eric Braden and Michael Mooney, Victor and Adam? Really awkward. I guess Michael Mooney, he's on Twitter and he says what he thinks a lot. And he said something about how, mm, it was insulting to fans to believe that Victor has died for the 148th time or something like that. He just basically said that he thought it was insulting to the fans that they were doing another Victor is dead storyline. And Eric Braden, who just signed up for Twitter, apparently just f like flamed back and said something about how it's it's for a someone for someone who's been on the show for three years to cr cr to say that a, a storyline involving a 30-year veteran is insulting, is just delusional ignorance, something like that. So and it was very weird because Michael Mooney retweeted it and obviously there's some tension, like real tension going on behind the scenes there. I think probably just all of the casting changes, the, all, the new executives, it's probably making everyone on edge, but I like it. I think it's going to fuel everything that's going to be happening on screen. If, Victor, if Michael Mooney and Eric Braden don't get along, it's just going to make it that much better on screen watching them try to one up each other so just in general everything that's going down I'm really happy with it right now I hope that you guys are too because I think we're headed in a good good direction so the new opening credits how awesome are they like I, I watched the opening credits a hundred times I seriously did I sat there and I watched you know how it's like a split screen it's it's one just face shot of the actor and then it's a motion shot of them doing something in action and I literally went and I watched the opening credits on YouTube and I'm like okay right now I'm just gonna watch all of the face shots and then I would just watch everybody's close-up face shot and then I'm like I go back rewind it. okay now I'm gonna watch all of 
the motion shots and I just watched all the motion shots and then I went back and I watched all of the backgrounds to try to figure out where they were all standing in their face shot and like I'm ridiculous I watched it so many times I it was like a hundred times I swear <laughs> but it's so good I really really enjoyed them I like I thought that like we've only seen two so far in the US I'm sure Canadians have seen the third set um, but for us the two that I've seen were really good I thought that the the best opening the person who had the best opening was Phyllis like she just looked really good in her in her face shot she's just given this really spry they picked a good like segment of her she's just kind of moving around moving back and giving a look to the camera that was just really good she looked awesome in it um, of course Nikki and Victor Eric Braden and Melody Thomas Scott were at the top of both of the opening sequences so I don't know if maybe they have some kind of deal that their title card is in every single show maybe I'm not sure, but I thought that was interesting. Victor looked good. Nikki, I liked her motion shot where she's hugging Victor, but I didn't think her face shot was that good. I don't know what it is. Her hair looked a little weird, and she just looked a little uncomfortable. I think Nikki looks best when she's not trying. You know, she, she looks good. I mean, she looks good normally. I've been talking all about it, but there's something about her. She looks a little uncomfortable in her shot, but I thought, and all in all, I really thought everybody looked pretty good. Paul looked pretty damn dapper coming around the corner. <laughs> it's so much better than his title card from the last one that was like 10 years old of him shirtless on a beach. Paul's shirtless on a beach days are over. <laughs> But he looked good. Just he looked real dapper. I thought. I thought Jack looked good too. Um, I want to see Neil's. I wonder what Neil's gonna look like. Um, everybody was just really good. Like I thought, um, Catherine's was was just good. She like the the two split screens. Okay, on the motion one, Catherine is throwing up some money or some paper. I don't know what that is. Do you guys know what that is? Is that an old scene or was that something that they filmed new? She's just sitting back in a board room chair and she throws up some paper or something or some money or something into the air I don't know what it was I that's like a really good question please if you guys know what scene that's from please let me know I'd love to I'd love to know and then in her face shot she's just sitting in a chair and she just gives an eyebrow raise it's so cute <laughs> hers was really really good um let's see Adams was very Adam Adam was being very Adam in his <laughs> <laughs> the face shot was of course very brooding and then they had the outdoor walking shot of him with his, his hair kind of different again I wonder is that from a previous scene or did they just go out and shoot that uh, just for this I don't know I, I thought you know probably rivaling Phyllis was Victoria's because I thought Victoria looked really good she had one shot where she's home in her little 50 style dress but the one her face shot where she's just standing by the window was so good like the lighting was just like pow her face just popped she just looks so beautiful she looked awesome in it um you know Sharon looked good I think it's all in perception for me right now because it's going to take some work for me to start to see the beauty in Sharon again. It, she's just been through the ringer so much. Like her last title card, she was kind of looking up angelically. <laughs> There was one, I think, where she was kissing somebody or doing something, but the one, her face shot was just looking up and over angelically, like she, she was a beautiful snow angel. And now it's just, she's very uh, more mature, and I'm very confident in myself, and I've got my hand on my hips, and, and I'm, you know, I'm going to maybe mess you, maybe screw you over, was kind of the look that she was giving. Um, it's going to take a while for me to get back on the Sharon train, but... All in all, I think everybody looked really good. I can't wait to hear what you guys think about the credits and about the whole show this week. Oh my gosh. Okay, so it's your turn. I've talked way, 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 way too much. I know you guys have so much to say you have to. Oh my god. If, you, if you're not loving this week's show, I don't know what to say because it, it was good. And I really can't wait to hear all of your comments. So please feel free. There's a comment box here below where I'm talking. Don't hesitate. Tell me everything you're thinking. Use one box, two box, three comment boxes. I don't care. Get it all out there. Send me a message. Whatever you want to do. I can't wait to hear what you guys are thinking. All right. It's been really long for me. This is like an extra long special version or something of the YNR chat. I got to go. <laughs>
But I love you guys, and I will be back next week to chat again about the show. Mwah! Bye!